Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Psalm 103. This is a psalm we began last time about blessing God. And I want to continue to finish this chapter, verse 15, down to verse 22. And I've titled this, The Greatness of Our God. Sadly, we live in a generation where people use the name of the Lord in vain. And not just using his name whenever something happens, they might say, oh God but also in the way they worship. They worship a God of their imagination, but he's not the God of scripture. And this is one of the points that as the Lord has taught me over the years, I've gone back to read this word that we hold in our hands and to consider how great is the God of the Bible. And I know that's how the Lord dealt in my life as I considered how I'd been brought up and how I'd been taught and all my theological studies, the concept of God, even using the Bible. But then when it pleased God to open my eyes and to see him as he is, I went back and began to read again and became so overwhelmed with who God is and how little in my flesh I had brought him any honor if at all and so that's what we see here in Psalm 103 from verse 15 down to verse 22 the greatness of our God we read in verse 15 and remember this is a Psalm of David so he's contemplating these things as he writes he says as for man his days are as grass as a flower of the field so he flourisheth, for the wind passeth over, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So there are four particular points that I want to bring out here in this portion concerning the greatness of God. And in verses 15 to 18, we see his greatness over the life of man. We're not just talking about physical life, but spiritual life. And then in verse 19, we see his greatness over all creation. Where it says the Lord has established his throne in heaven, his kingdom rules over all. There's no aspect or part of this world or creation where God does not rule. All things come from his hand and are to him and for him. And then thirdly, in verses 20 to 22, we see his greatness over his angels. You might wonder well, why all of a sudden does David here in verse 20 speak of his angels, bless the Lord ye his angels. I believe he was contemplating how those elect angels night and day worship the Lord God, even as Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, around the throne, without ceasing, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then in the final verse, verse 22, we see his greatness over all his works, as if 
any part may have been left out. Now he just says all his works. Wherever you look and see the works of God, whether in creation or in providence or in salvation or in condemnation, all things are according to his works. How great then is our God. In Psalm 115, and this is a portion that the Lord gave to me and my wife years ago when we'd first gotten to Africa and she was pregnant. And then the Lord took our twins. And I can remember sitting in the hospital room while she was recovering. It wasn't much of a hospital room. It was just a basic building with structure. They called it a hospital. And as we were contemplating what had just occurred, it was this particular psalm that I was reading that the Lord gave us comfort and we shared together. Psalm 115, it says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? And here it is, verse 3. But our God, see that's why I've entitled this the greatness of our God. He is the God of all. And yet for his children, those that he has chosen and Christ has redeemed, our God is in the heavens and what he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. So there we see in one particular portion just how great God is. In contrast, come back here to my text in Psalm 103, in contrast with man, how short is man's life and uncertain? Here it says in verse 15, as for man, and remember it's connected with what David had just said in verse 14 concerning his children. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. This is how God looks upon us. We live and move and have our being in him. But as for man... This is why we don't put any confidence in men, not even in doctors that the Lord has given wisdom to or others that we look to for advice and counsel. They're but men, but particularly ourselves as human beings. That's what the term there suggests. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. You think about the flower of the garden that you plant and cultivate and work on so that it manifests some kind of beauty. You care for it as a caretaker, if you will. I'm never much good with flowers anyway. I've always said if they can't last on their own, then they probably won't last. But you think about even the flower of the field in verse 15. How many times have you driven down the road and seen wildflowers growing? And you wonder just how beautiful they are, and yet they're just but wildflowers. The Lord has put them there, but they're there today and gone tomorrow. And this is how man is compared to God who is everlasting and that gives life to all things but again if he gives life to all things when that flower fades that means that's the Lord taking it away what is it that causes the flower to have its beauty it's God what is it that causes the flower to fade away it's God all these things are from the hand of God and when the flower is gone. I know sometimes you like to try to keep a flower for a special occasion and put it away and press it and do all those things. But no matter what, when you go back and look at it years later, it's just a dead flower. 
It does not have the beauty that it once had. And typically, when the flower is gone, its place remembers it no more. Where it was, where it flourished, remembers it no more. And that's what man is compared to who God is. And that's why I say here, the greatness of our God with regard to the life of man, not only physical life, but spiritual life. Look at verse 17. This is what David is reflecting upon here concerning the spiritual life that God had given him. Yes, the Lord had raised him to be a king, raised him up and set him upon that throne. But as his days advanced and he understood that his days were numbered, he considers even himself as that flower in verse 16 where the wind passes over it and it is gone. The wind in scripture has to do with the very breath of God. That's why I said God gives life and God takes it away and that place thereof shall know it no more. But what is of value? It's the spiritual life. And this is what David reflects on here in verse 17. Under the term, the mercy of the Lord, he says, is from everlasting to everlasting. That means where God has purposed that mercy upon any sinner, it is forever. And this is true life. When you stop and consider to be a vessel of mercy versus a vessel of wrath. In scripture, there are the vessels of wrath that uh, God has made people who will live their lives benefiting from the physical life. But as a flower of the field, they pass and then they enter into judgment. But oh, to be a vessel of mercy, consider the greatness of our God in his mercy. That word Mercy speaks of a covenant love, one in which God himself has purposed to set his affection upon a sinner and loves that sinner with an everlasting love, a love that is not conditioned on the sinner, that even when this physical life is past, yet everlastingly, that sinner will enjoy the presence of God forever. It has to do with his loyalty, his faithfulness, his mercy that endures from age to age. I'm thankful that's so. I'm reading a scripture here that David wrote 500 plus years before Christ came and I'm reading it now, some 2,000 years from the time that Christ came, but this word still is true. And as I read it, I can contemplate and see how the Lord's mercy is everlasting. God's love does not alter with our alterings or change with our changes. In fact, it's the Lord that brings about the changes in our lives, just like seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. There are seasons that God has determined for this world, but also for his people. Someone asked the question one time, does the mother's love fluctuate with the moods of her sick baby or her children? No, that love the manifestation of that love is forever. This is how Jeremiah put it over in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. To understand God's covenant love, that's what this mercy is because in Psalm 103 verse 18, he says, to such as keep his co covenant. Those that keep his covenant are those that God himself has made that covenant with in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has paid their sin debt and saved them by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They keep his covenant. They're kept in that covenant. Jeremiah 31 in verse 3 is the way 
he puts it here. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Why is it that any sinners are drawn to this God? It's because he has loved them with an everlasting love. And when you see that word everlasting love, you can put next to it Christ. That's how God has loved sinners in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That covenant that God the Father made was with his son. That his son should come and pay the sin debt. Lay down his life in order to redeem those sinners that the Father has given him in that everlasting love and covenant. And thereby they are his. And as it says there, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I know this, that everyone that God has loved in this covenant that is described here, a covenant of mercy, when it speaks of the mercy of the Lord, think of the mercy seat where that blood was sprinkled on that mercy seat once a year in the Old Testament on what was called the Day of Atonement. But that mercy seat being the Lord Jesus Christ who came and shed his blood once for all that those sinners that God has loved and brought into covenant with himself would enjoy that mercy forever. How great then is God? We as men, as humans, we make covenants just to break them. We see that all the time. You see a bride and a groom making their vows with one another. Next thing you know, they're saying, I love you. And next thing you know is I hate you. That's man. But here when it says the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. How great then is that mercy? That nothing that we do can change or affect how God purposes to be merciful to such sinners as we are. When our Lord Jesus Christ was about to lay down his life over in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, he speaks here of that covenant love that he came to ratify. In the Old Testament, it's depicted in type and picture and prophecy and promise. But in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, as he instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he took that bread and gave thanks for it and then took the cup. Verse 20, Luke 22, he says, this cup is the New Testament. And that word testament is the word covenant. So to keep covenant, back here in verse 18, to such as keep his covenant, it's those that see that it's only in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that God can be merciful and show mercy, gracious, and show grace. But it's through his shed blood. This cup is the New Testament, what? In my blood, which is shed for you. It wasn't shed for everybody, but it was shed for those that God himself purposed to show mercy to. And so those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ are in that covenant relationship with him, set apart and are members of one household. That's one thing to consider here, that this is not just particular to one individual. When David is thinking of this, that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, he says, upon them that fear him. Well, who are those that fear him, but those that God by his spirit has pointed them to Christ and drawn them to the Lord Jesus Christ. They hear his voice. And his righteousness, his justice, it says in verse 17, unto children's children. How is the justice of God satisfied? It's in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therein was David's hope. In fact, in 2 Samuel 23 in verse 5, you know what it says here to such as keep his covenant. He wasn't thinking that somehow 
he had lived in such a way as God then would show him mercy. No, to keep his covenant means to remain in that covenant which God himself has made with those sinners for whom Christ came and paid their sin debt. If you wonder whether David thought himself to be somehow deserving of God's covenant, well, read his testimony in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And we can begin in verse 1. It says, Now these be the last words of David. This is the sum of it. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God, of the God of Jacob. So he acknowledged that anything he was was because of God's anointing and appointing. And the sweet psalmist of Israel said, first of all, number verse two, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Even what we're reading here in Psalm 103, these are not David's mere words. This is the Spirit of the Lord speaking by him. And he says in verse 3, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springeth out of the earth by clear shining after rain. So when, though, when David wrote these words, speaking of he that ruleth over men must be just, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking about Christ, who is the rock of Israel, that rules over men, rules in the fear of God, and is the light of the morning. All of those are descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ. In contrast to what we read here in verse 5 concerning David, although my house be not so with God. Yet he hath made with me, what? An everlasting covenant. That means that God, having purposed to save David and raise him up, it was in an everlasting covenant. And there again, you can put next to that, in Christ, because of Christ, that seed that should come from David, ordered in all things and sure, he said, for this is all my salvation and all my what? Desire. I believe those that God has purposed to save in that covenant love in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that does not alter, does not change. God's not reacting to who we are in our sinfulness because Christ is the representative head of that covenant. He is the one who has paid the sin debt. And therefore, he is all my desire. That's what it is to keep the covenant. To have all our desire to be in none other than in Christ. And that covenant mercy in him. And he says, although he make it not to grow. This is in times where it seems like everything might be against us. And yet even then... God is keeping his own in that covenant mercy. Do you see then the greatness of God in contrast to what man is in his temporal life? God, not only the giver of life, but physically, but spiritually, that all that we are and have is in him and because of him. That's what the writer to the Hebrews wrote of over in Hebrews chapter 13, if you'd like to turn there, Hebrews chapter 13. See, this is the opposite of what the world thinks of God. They perceive God to be a being that now we somehow have to approach and satisfy and be about our best and always doing, attempting to gain his favor. But such a God is not the God of the Bible. If man has that perception of the God of the Bible, then they're under condemnation. They're yet blind and in darkness. No, the view of God as he's revealed in scripture is that he 
is the author of all things in it. He has set his love upon sinners that he has chosen and uh, for whom the Lord Jesus Christ has come and paid the debt. Here, here in Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 20, notice how it's written. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. How could he be called the God of peace when he's holy and his justice stands against the sinner? Well, he's the God of peace for those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt being justified by his shed blood we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why the connection in verse 20 he's the God of peace for those for whom Christ died because he's the one that brought him again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep and notice here through the blood of the everlasting covenant it took him coming and shedding his blood, but once that blood was shed, it was forever. It wasn't to be repeated like the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament where every year there had to be that blood sprinkled on the mercy seat once a year. Now here, it is the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's why when Christ died, God the Father once for all justified, sanctified, redeemed, glorified, everyone for whom he paid the debt. And it is everlasting. That's what our hope of glory is. And I'm thankful that it's so. So the greatness of God in contrast to man and what man is in his temporal life. But come back here to my text in Psalm 103 and let's look at the second Division, and that is the greatness of God over all creation. There in verse 19, it says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. There are many today that see the world as being divided. And on one side, you've got God, and on the other side, you've got the devil. And it's like a tug of war between good and evil. Well, that's not what we read here. Here it says that the Lord has prepared. That word actually means has established. This is speaking of a throne that is settled and has been settled forever. This is a God who reigns. We, we sing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And because his throne is established... In the heavens, that means that on earth there's nothing that takes place but what he has ordained it. This is how the Lord taught his disciples to pray, what they call the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' pray, prayer when he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm hallowing the name of God exalting his name, setting apart above all names. But then it goes on to say, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Now that's not hoping that his will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. In that prayer, it's making a statement. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So in other words, his throne that rules over all, that kingship come, that thy will be done. That's how his kingdom come. That's how he manifests his kingship in accomplishing his will on earth, even as it is in heaven. Sometimes we can wonder about things that occur and wonder, well, how on earth does that fit into God's purpose? Well, it's all according to his purpose. If we believe what the scriptures say, this is where we see his greatness over all creation. And his throne is established in heaven beyond all the troubles and corruptions of this earth. And it can never be moved. He is God, very God. And therefore his kingdom rules over all. 
This again is in contrast to man and his life and his supposed rule on this earth. There's no rule here on earth but what God has ordained it. We see that particularly over in Romans chapter 13. And remember, Paul was writing this to the Romans that were enduring one of the worst dictatorships that you could ever imagine under these different Caesars that ruled. And those that confessed Christ were losing their lives, were being persecuted. And yet, what does Paul write here in Romans 13? Verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, whatever that power may be. A lot of times we think of men in positions of power, but there are also evil powers such as Satan himself. Satan would not exist were it not that God had ordained it ordained that he be and uh, he's ordained not only his existence but he's ordained his end satan's god is god himself even though he himself does not bow to him and is in utter rebellion yet he can't do one thing but what god ordains we found that so in the case of job where he asked he had to ask of God to do what he did to Job. And even there, when God gave him the authority, he said that he could give him so much authority, but not to take his life. Such is the power of God. And I'll tell you, that's a comfort to know that even in our lives, when oppressed by Satan, because we know that Satan does oppress the Lord's children. He cannot possess them, but he does oppress them. But that even is according to God's purpose. Lest we should put any confidence in ourselves or in the flesh. And it says in verse 2 of Romans 13, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. And so... We see there the greatness of God over all of creation, whatever it is. Coming back to my text in Psalm 103 and verse 19. Thirdly, we see the greatness of God over his angels. And again, it might be a surprise that suddenly moving from men to all of creation now to angels... What is it here in particular that the Lord directed David to write that would cause him to even address here actually the angels? When he says in verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Here again, it's a reminder because people today get caught up with angels. You'll see people have little angels that they have on their, their mantles or they, they carry them, dangle them from their rear view mirror. Some have little angel pins and, you know, all of that's nothing but idolatry because nowhere in scripture are we ever taught to give credence to angels and give prominence to them no they are god's creatures and uh, this just shows the idolatry of the heart where men would rather worship angels than they would to worship the god of angels and were the angels to testify they themselves would say that there was a time where in the book of Revelation, the Lord sent one of his messengers to John. And uh, it so impressed John that he fell down to worship that messenger, which was an angel. And the angel made him stand up and said to him that he was not to be worshipped, but he was sent by 
the very God who was the God of John and the God of all of his people. And that even the angels do nothing but bless the Lord. You can see all the things here. People like to get into studies of angels. Well, there's probably been more books written on angels than what the scriptures themselves say. So that ought to be a warning right there. But here in one verse, they excel in strength. That is in God's strength. They wouldn't be had it not been God that had created them and preserved them. Because we know there are those that fell according to God's purpose. But these particularly are what we call elect angels. And they serve God night and day. That's why he preserved them. They do his commandments. We're not aware perhaps just when the angels may be sent to minister unto us. I don't believe they're appearing as physical beings for his children today. But even as the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, that many have entertained angels unawares. But even there, we're not to become curious and make the angels the object of our attention or focus. Because what do they do? Verse 20 says, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And therein is our example then in the greatness of our God. Just as the angels bless God night and day and give him all the glory. How much more so than those of us that are his people by covenant mercy. Peter said that even the angels desire to look into these things whereby God has been merciful to sinners such as we are. And they bless God in his greatness. How much more so than those of us that are his children. And then fourthly, coming back here to Psalm 103, verse 22. Verse 21 is in that same context. Bless the Lord, all ye his hosts. That's a reference then. Who knows? People like to argue, well, how many angels can fit on a pin of a needle? <laughs> That's just foolishness. All ye his hosts. God in his glory has all of the hosts of heaven like an army, that's how they're described, at his command, what? To do his pleasure. And uh, so even as it is with angels, so it is with men to accomplish God's pleasure according to his command, such is our God. But fourthly, as if to sum it all up here in verse 22, it says, bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So we see here the greatness of God over all his works. David extends this call to honor and praise to the God of the universe further than just the angels, but to all of God's works in all places. That means there's no place anywhere in the world or in the universe that does not redound to the glory of God and the accomplishment of his purpose. And here it's as if all of creation in one voice celebrates the God of its creation and of providence. You stop and think about our littleness as man not only in this world but you've seen those pictures of galaxies in the universe and how small not only the earth is as a whole but who we are as as creatures and yet all of this is in the hands of a sovereign god and all of creation redounds to his glory. But this is a personal matter for David. You see at the end there in verse 22, 
when he says, bless the Lord, all, all his works and all places of his dominion. But then he sums it up with, bless the Lord, O my soul. That's where true praise and honor and glory is drawn out of those that are the Lord's. It's from the soul, a soul that has been made alive by the very spirit of God to know him and therefore to bless him and to glorify him. These are all the reasons given here in Psalm 103. You see, it began in verse 1 with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And it ends with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Who are those that truly bless him, but those that he has been merciful to, and by his Spirit has been pleased to reveal himself in. I pray that's a help. I know it is to me. It's good to go back and read these and contemplate the greatness of our God. And may he truly receive all the honor and glory. Amen. <laughs>